So I'm uh, I'm Dylan Beatty, and uh, today it's my my great pleasure. I wish I could be with all of you out there in in Moscow, as it is. We're all doing this online, but I am going to use the wonderful power of the internet and live streaming video to tell you the story of the art of code, and the story starts here. Amstrad microcomputer 1985, the first computer that I ever owned. It ran CPM, I was seven years old, and it was not a very interesting computer, but it came with a programming language called Logo. And the wonderful thing about Logo for me as a child playing with this computer was that I could use Logo to make the computer draw pictures. Now, this is in the days there was no Photoshop, there was no Unreal Engine, there was no Illustrator and, you know, Balsamic, none of this existed. Just getting the computer to draw circles and squares was still a pretty big deal. And using Logo, I could make this Amstrad computer draw these amazing pictures. And I thought this was brilliant. And when when I got the computer to draw the pictures that I wanted to see, I got this rush, you know, this thrill, this sense of, I did it, I am successful, I have made the computer do what I want. And for me, that thrill has never gone away. And, you know, over the, the course of a conference like at J-Point here, you've seen some people talk about some important things and useful things, security, performance optimization, garbage collection, memory management, all these kinds of ideas. But I'm not going to talk to you about any of those things. I'm going to talk to you about this. I'm going to talk to you about the art of code. Now, there is a quote from uh, the great British author, uh, Irish author, Oscar Wilde. Um, and Oscar Wilde had this quote, he said, all art is quite useless. Art has no purpose. And like I said, there's a lot of things in software which are useful and practical and important. And I'm gonna talk to you about useless things, but maybe, Art is not actually useless after all. There is another quote from another author. This one was British. This is Douglas Adams, who wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books. And he said in one of his books, the function of art is to hold a mirror up to nature. He's paraphrasing from Shakespeare there. And we can use art to understand the world we live in. We can use art to uh, you know, explore the world around us and see things, understand things, explore things we've not seen before. And if we want to do that, if we want to hold a mirror up to nature, before we can do that, we have to invent the mirror. And that is where science and technology gets involved. Because for hundreds of years, we human beings have used science and technology to explore the world around us. We've invented scanning electron microscopes that have let us take pictures like this one here, crystals on the eyelid of a beetle. It's been there the whole time for thousands of years, but we had never seen it until we invented machines that allowed us to take these kinds of photographs. This is crystals growing inside a dish of soy sauce. This is one frond inside the stem of the leaf from a banana plant. And we've also built machines that allow us to explore our universe. We've sent cameras and satellites and robots and people into space. We've looked back on planet Earth from the far side of the moon. We've looked back on planet Earth from beyond the rings of Saturn. We've even taken pictures like this one here. This is a thing called the Pillars of Creation. It's in the Eagle Nebula, 6,000 light years away from Earth. And within the last few decades, we've started using technology to explore another hidden world that's been here hidden under our noses the whole time, a world of mathematics and information. During the 1970s, a guy called Martin Gardner wrote a column every month in Scientific American magazine. And the most influential, the most famous of his mathematical columns was this one. This was October 1970, where he introduced the world to something called John Conway's Game of Life. Now, uh, John Conway died a few months ago. And uh, he sort of said towards the, the end of his career, I don't want to be remembered for the game of life. And John Conway did a whole bunch of amazing things, uh, areas of research around mathematics and surreal numbers, all kinds of stuff. But I'm sorry, John, life is what I am going to remember you for, because life is the thing that the first time I saw it, I was hooked by how beautiful and how wonderful it was. Now, 
when the game of life was first published it's a game that's very very simple to play it's played on an infinite board it's a game with no players you can't win and it only has four rules the first rule of the game of life all of these little cells on the grid they are living or they are dead and if a cell has zero or one neighbors it will die of loneliness if a cell has two or three neighbors it will survive into the next generation if a cell has four or more neighbors it will die of overcrowding and if a cell has exactly three neighbors it will come back to life in the next generation that's it that is the entire rules of conway's game of life but what happens when we start applying those rules and iterating systems based on them now when the game of life was first published in 1970 people had to use graph paper and pencils to explore it and find out how it works and they had things like this the life histories of the five tetrominoes and you can sort of you can see how they're changing from one generation to the next and you can see how they're starting to give some of these shapes names but studying the game of life with graph paper is like studying butterflies in a museum in a glass case you see what they look like but you have no idea how they behave you don't know what it's like when they actually you know come to life it wasn't <coughs> pardon me until we started using computers to explore the game of life that we really worked at what it was that John Conway had discovered here. We're going to take those five shapes, the five tetrominoes, and we're going to animate them and look at what we get. Four of these shapes settle down almost immediately, but one of them goes for about 10, 11 generations, and then it goes into this infinitely repeating pattern. And as we started using computers to experiment and explore the game of life, people discovered some astonishing things. They discovered this shape here, this is the glider. It just glides across the infinite grid, never ending, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And they discovered configurations like this one here. This was discovered by Bill Gosper and his team in the early 1970s. This is Gosper's glider gun. This is a stable configuration that gives birth to a glider every 27 generations. We discovered another configuration, this one here. This is called the Eater. This will consume any glider that intercepts with it, but it will survive. It won't destroy itself in the process. And what this means is that within the game of life now, we have a way to create a signal and we have a way to destroy a signal. We have truth, we have false, we have one, we have zero. And it turns out that we can use the game of life to create logic gates. Have a look at this. This is an AND gate implemented in the game of life. We have our two inputs, A, B, and we have our output, A and B. Now, if I set one of these inputs to true and I run the circuit, our output is still false no signal. If I flip the inputs, I set the other input to true, I activate the circuit, we get no output. The output of our circuit is still false. If I set both of these inputs to be true now, when I run that circuit, execute that program, what I am going to get is truth on the output. I'm going to get something coming out there. Now, it turns out that if you can build logic gates in any system, you can use those to create circuits. And if you can create circuits, you can create computers. And if you can create computers, you can run computer programs like this one, which you might have heard about recently. This is a program called John Conway's Game of Life. Now, the game of life is just one of a whole family of mathematical systems that take very, very simple conditions, simple inputs, and turn them into very, very complex and unpredictable outputs. You may have heard the expression, the butterfly effect, this idea that trying to forecast weather systems is almost impossible because if a butterfly flaps its wings in Beijing, two weeks later, we're going to have hurricanes instead of sunshine in Sao Paulo. But there's a whole category of systems, mathematical systems, that exhibit this complex behavior from simple rules and inputs. Now, in order to really understand these, we need to discover and start exploring one of the most amazing things in the whole field of mathematics. I'm going to take a piece of graph paper like this, and I'm going to draw a square, two by two. And what do you think is the area of that square? 
It's not a trick question. The area is four, four units. Now I'm going to draw another square, and this square is minus two by minus two. What is the area of this second square? Well, it's also going to be four, four units. So if two times two is four, and minus two times minus two is also four, how do we get minus four? How do we get minus two, minus one? What number can we multiply by itself to get a negative result? Now, this is where engineering and physics say there is no such thing. That does not exist. And mathematics says, here, hold my beer. I'm going to invent something. We're just going to come up with an imaginary number, and we are going to come up with this i. And i squared equals minus 1. We just decided that that was a thing. We're going to take this number, make a new number called i that didn't exist before, and we just have a rule that says if i times i will be negative. That's how this works. It's imaginary because it doesn't occur in nature, or does it? But this is the rule. And then based on this rule, we are going to start doing all kinds of arithmetic. Now, the interesting thing happens when we combine imaginary numbers with real numbers, and we get what are called complex numbers. Now, this here is an example of a complex number, 0.8 of real stuff, 1.2i of imaginary stuff. This is plotted on a graph here, something called an Argand diagram. And as you can see, it has this imaginary part, it has this real part. Now, imaginary complex numbers work like software project plans. Part of them is real, part of them is imaginary, and they make it very, very difficult to predict what is going to happen next. Now, we can do arithmetic with these kinds of numbers. We can take 0.8 plus 1.2i. We say we want to square this. This works just like you learned in high school. We're going to expand out the brackets, and we're going to multiply all of these components by each other. The only rule, if you have i times i, the answer comes out negative. So anywhere here we multiply two blue numbers, the answer will come out negative. So we can go through, we can collect the real parts, the imaginary parts, crunch the whole thing down, and we can just do arithmetic with these complex numbers. Now, the first people to really study this were two French mathematicians working around 1910, 1911, uh, Gaston Julien and Pierre Fatou. Uh, they published this paper in 1918, Memoir sur l'iteration de fonction rationnelle memoir on the iteration of rational functions. Now, I have not read this paper. It is very long and it is in French, but I have read lots of books written by people who read this paper. And what Gaston Julia and, and Fatou were studying here was not solving equations. They were studying the behavior of equations. Let's look at an example. We have a function here that maps x goes to x plus 1. And so we start at 0 and we get 1. And then 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 4, now, you can see kind of almost immediately, there are no surprises in this function. This is not going to do anything unexpected. It's just going to go all the way to infinity, one number at a time. We have another function, x goes to 2 minus x, so we start with 0. 2 minus 0 is 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. 2 minus 0 is 2. Round and round and round we go. This is a stable repeating system. If we look at doing the same thing with squared numbers, we start with 2, 2 squares to 4, 4 squares to 16, 256, and whee, off we go towards infinity. No surprises, it just gets faster. If we start with a smaller number, half squares to a quarter, quarter squares to a sixteenth, 16 squares to 1, 256, and so on towards 0. Never actually gets there, but it's going to tend towards 0. Now, what happens? If we take one of these complex numbers and we do this iteration, we're going to take this number z and we're going to say z is going to go to z squared. So when we square 0.7 plus 0.8i, it ends up over here. And then we square it again and it ends up over here. And then it goes to here and then it goes to here and then we disappears off to. Now, there are four different kinds of infinity on this graph. There is positive imaginary infinity, and there is negative imaginary infinity, and then there is positive and negative real infinity. So four different kinds of infinity, and this is going to head off towards one of them. Now, let's look at what happens if we take a bunch of points that are almost next to each other, really, really close to each other. The first one here this goes flying off towards negative imaginary infinity. The second one almost next to it, that goes to positive real infinity. This one goes off to positive imaginary infinity. But then look at this one here. This one doesn't go to infinity. This one bounces around for a while, and then it slows right down. It does this little kind of crawl around the orbit, almost like it's drawing a circle. And it bounces around a bit more, and it crosses the axis a bunch of times, and it looks like it's drawing a circle again. And just as we think we know what it's going to do, it gets bored, and it says, nah, I'm done, and disappears off to infinity after something like 74 generations. This blue one here bounces a couple of times, disappears down the hole in the middle of the graph. Purple one does the same thing. These points 
are almost adjacent. The inputs are almost identical, and the function is the same. Z goes to Z squared in every case. Now, about 50 years after Fatou and uh, Julia did their work on, on rational functions, this guy comes along. Now, you may not know who this is, but you have heard his name. This is a Polish mathematician, born in Poland, grew up in France, studied and worked in the United States. And his name was Benoit Mandelbrot. And Benoit Mandelbrot, he had an awesome job. He taught mathematics at the University of Harvard, and he was a computer researcher at IBM in the days when IBM had computers and most people didn't. And he would bounce between Harvard and IBM and he'd go to Harvard, he'd come up with all these cool ideas and talk to the other mathematicians there. Then he'd go back to IBM and he'd put the ideas in the computers and see what they could do. And Mandelbrot was fascinated by the mathematics of nature. He had this very famous quote, clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, coastlines are not circles. Bark is not smooth, nor does lightning travel in a straight line. He loved the texture and the qualities of the arithmetic and the mathematics of nature, of the world all around us. And somewhere along the way, Mandelbrot had this idea. He said, what happens if I take one of these complex numbers and I square it, and then I add the number I started with, C, and I square it, and I add the number I started with, and I square it, and I add the number I started with, and I go round and round there, and I'm gonna take all these points on this graph. I'm gonna plot these points through this function, and if those points disappear off to infinity, I'm gonna leave them blank. But if after like a hundred generations, they have not gone to infinity yet, I'm just gonna plot a point at that point on the graph. And that was the exact algorithm that was used to draw the first rendition anybody had ever seen of this shape, the Mandelbrot set. This was produced on an IBM teleprinter in the very early 1980s. This was the, the first time anybody had seen this shape. Now, we got better at doing arithmetic with computers. We also invented screens and we invented color displays. And we came up with the algorithm, which is the same one that I implemented on my 286 PC with one megabyte of memory way back in the 1990s. You take a point. If the point goes to infinity quickly, you color it blue. If it goes to infinity slowly, purple. If it takes a long time, but then eventually it goes off to infinity, you color it red. And if it never goes towards infinity, you color it in black. That's the algorithm that we use to draw these kinds of shapes. This is what my 286 PC could do after three or four hours. But of course, we have more powerful computers now. And we can draw shapes and renditions like this, the Mandelbrot set. Now, the astonishing thing about the Mandelbrot, what we call the M set, is that there is an infinity of detail buried in that one simple equation. Z goes to Z squared plus C. We are going to take a Mandelbrot set and we are going to zoom into it. And we are going to start magnifying, and we are going to start magnifying. And as we are zooming into this shape around the bat now, I'm going to say that's magnification factor one. Uh, for me, that's just about filling my, my two-meter television screen here. And we're going to zoom in further and further and further. We get to about here, and that original shape is now larger than Moscow. And we are zooming in further and further. We are not running out of detail, but there's also no repetition. We get to about here, the original shape is larger than Russia. The original shape shape is now larger than the continents of Europe and Asia put together. The original shape is bigger than planet Earth. It's bigger than the solar system, and we are zooming in and in and in. And the shape never repeats. There is no repetition. At every level of magnification, there is a new infinity of detail, all coming from that one single equation. Z goes to Z squared plus C. When we get to this point, we see something that looks familiar. Now, this is not an exact replica. This is called self-similarity. At various levels, as we zoom into this shape, we see things that are reminiscent. They're the same kind of outline. They're not the same shape. That would be repetition, and then it wouldn't be infinity. It would just be a loop. There is an infinity of detail here. And all of this, you know, this was not invented. This was discovered. We invented imaginary numbers, and we invented complex arithmetic. And then we invented computers, which is putting lightning inside a rock until it learns how to think, right? And then we invented high-definition color displays and floating point cal calculating units and coprocessors and all these kinds of things. And when we got all those things right, we found this. Now, some people have said that the Mandelbrot set is the thumbprint of God. I'm not a terribly spiritual person, 
I prefer to think of it like we're all playing some great big computer game and we've gone off on a side quest and we found an Easter egg hidden in the fabric of our reality that the game designers put there to say, well done, human beings, you're on the right track. This is good stuff. Keep this up. Now, <clears throat> Just the idea of putting interesting shapes on a computer screen is not quite as big a deal as it was back in the 1980s. You know, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, back in the, the early 80s, we had Tron, which was the first computer-generated motion picture. Then after Tron, we had Luxo Jr., which was a completely computer-generated cartoon. We had Jurassic Park, where we had digital dinosaurs and human actors on the same screen at the same time. A few years back, we had this guy. Now, who is this? Because some people say this is Peter Cushing, he's a British actor and he's dead, and you shouldn't have used his likeness in the film. Other people say, no, 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 this is a fictional character. This is Grand Moff Tarkin from the Star Wars films, and he's owned by Lucasfilm. We can do whatever we like. Who's right? We don't know. But we have technology now where we can have uh, living people playing dead characters and dead people playing living characters. We can put them all up on a cinema screen and the whole thing is completely believable. We can even ask questions like, what would happen if they made the TV show Friends, except they remade it and they got Nicolas Cage to play all of the parts? <laughs> that was uh, terrific. Really bitchin'. Now, <laughs> the reason we can do things like that is that we have created computers that can replicate the way the human brain behaves. Now, you ever lie on your back on a sunny day and there's clouds kind of drifting across the sky and you're looking up and you're like, oh, look, that one looks like a rabbit and that one looks like a dog and that one looks like a cat. And what is happening is your brain is recognizing patterns. And we have created computer systems that we don't know if they work the same way, but we know they can produce a similar kind of output. They're called convolutional neural networks. Now, the thing about neural networks, we don't really program them, we train them. We build a network that has no inbuilt behavior. And then we say, right, here's a bunch of training data. These are cats, these are dogs, you figure it out. And the computer goes and it crunches through a couple of thousand dog and cat pictures and it eventually goes, right, I got it. I can recognize cats now. Now, this might not sound terribly difficult. Like, uh, for example, how difficult could it be to tell the difference between a puppy and a, and a muffin, right? Well. It turns out it's actually a lot harder than anybody thinks. But when it gets really interesting is when we take this dog detector that we've created, this algorithm that can detect dogs, and we wire it in backwards. We flip it around and we turn it into a dog amplifier. And then we feed it some input data, which does not have any dogs in it. And we say, enhance the dogs. And the computer says, no, this is a horrible idea. And we say, enhance the dogs. And the computer goes, all right, but you're going to regret this. And we get the first generation. And the computer goes, this is a bad idea. And we go, no, no, turn up the power. Enhance the dogs. Maximum dog enhancement. And we get these kinds of pictures, these weird psychedelic pictures. And now the reason these are so weird is that when you look at these, a small part of your brain, the part of your brain that can recognize threats and predators that sees dogs and then you look at them closer and it's not a dog it's a kind of weird jellyfish thing with a is that a, a dog's eye or nose um and it's using these pattern recognition algorithms basically to exploit loopholes in the way the human visual system works and it gives you this really weird kind of psychedelic experience when you look at these now these this technique is called deep dreaming came out of a, a project called Deep Dream at Google at, where I ran about, I think, 10, 15 years ago now. And this is just one of the many, many forms of art that have only been possible because of digital technology and modern software and computer systems. But we've talked enough about using software to make art. Let's talk a little bit now about software that is art. Because there is this famous book, The Art of Computer Programming, Donald Nuth, which is basically saying computer programming is an art form. And we have these long discussions, don't we, where it's like, well, what is computer programming? Is it, is it an art? Is it science? Is it engineering? Uh, is it, are we hackers, developers, engineers, typists, you know, all these, these different things. And I've looked at code before, I've reviewed some code, maybe some code that I wrote a little while earlier in my career, and I've looked at it and I've been like, 
I don't know what this is. It's not engineering. I'm not going to call it science. I certainly wouldn't say this was an art form. But there is good news because there is now a safe space for this kind of code, and that is the International Obfuscated Code Contests. The goals of the original, the C code contest, were simple. To write the most obscure or obfuscated C program, to show the importance of programming style in an ironic way, to stress C compilers with unusual code, to illustrate the subtleties of the C language, and to provide a safe forum for poor C code. Now, this competition has run every year and is still running today. I want to show you an example from a recent round of it. Now, I'm sure there are some C programmers here. I know JPoint is mainly a Java conference, but we've all done a bit of C in our time, right? So take a look at this um, and, and tell me, uh, you want to drop a thing in the Telegram chat or something. Anyone know what this program does? Anyone want to do a quick code review here? Yes? No? Why don't we run it and find out? That might be a fun idea. Um, so I'm just going to run the make file, and then I'm going I'm to run the program, and, and look at that. It's Flappy Bird. Flappy Bird in a Unix terminal in 1,024 bytes of C code. Let's have a look at another one. I'll give you a, a little exercise here. Do a quick code review on this. Uh, Anybody? No? All right, let, let, me, let me give you a clue. I'm going to zoom out a little bit, because the code formatting here isn't really what would pass code review on any team I've ever worked on. But if we zoom out, look at that. It's a Mandelbrot set generator that looks like a Mandelbrot set implemented in one screen of C. Now, it's not just C. Here is one kilobyte, 1,024 bytes of JavaScript. And if you copy this and you paste it into your web browser, it'll play chess. It doesn't draw a chessboard, it plays chess. It is a chess engine that is better at chess than that Amstrad computer at the beginning of the talk. This is called Nano Chess. It is written by Oscar Toledo G, who is a genius at winning obfuscated coding competitions. Now, you might be thinking, how small can these programs get? Well, in 1994, Simon Rasinkovich submitted this entry to the obfuscated C code contest. This is not a problem with the stream. This is a blank screen because this is an empty file, zero bytes. And it was submitted with a readme that said, hey, if you compile this file, empty C file, with this compiler, you'll get a valid C program that produces no output. Therefore, this program prints its own source code. Now, the committee were not quite sure what to do with Simon Rasinkovich. Eventually, they said, OK, well done. This is brilliant. Have a prize. Also, we're going to change the rules of the contest. No more zero byte files. Everything has to have some, some text in it. But that gets us onto the idea of programs that print their own source code. These are called quines. After a section in this book, uh, Douglas, Hof Douglas Hofstadter's Gödel, Escher, and Bach, where he talks about William Ormand von Quine, who's a philosopher who studies statements that refer to themselves. Now, a quine is a program that prints its own source code. How difficult can that be? Well, let's have a look. Let's try and write a program in C Sharp that prints its own source. Sorry, Java people, I transplanted this from a different conference. So. We've got a class program. It has a static void main method. Now, the first thing we need to do is we need to print the class program. And then we need to print the static void main method. But then we need to print the next line of our program, which is the console write line, the console write. And, and very rapidly, we disappear into a nest of recursion, and we're never going to find our way out. Now, you cannot just ask the program to read its own source file from disk. That's not going to work. But there are loopholes in most languages that we can exploit to make these things work. Let's have a look at this example here. In C Sharp and in many other languages, there is a feature called string templating. So we can define a string literal that looks like this. Now you see the, the curly braces there with the 0, 1, 0? We can feed our program into itself. We can feed the string to itself as a positional parameter. And this is a C Sharp program that prints its own source code. Now. We can also do this in different languages. In JavaScript, everything has a toString. So in JavaScript, any function dot toString will give you the source code for that function. And in ECMAScript 6, this is a quine. Now, of course, when I saw this, I didn't believe it, because this looks like nonsense. And so I took that, and I printed it, and I copied and pasted it into the console in Google Chrome, and I ran it. And sure enough, that's a function that prints its own source code. And you can do this in all kinds of languages. But here's a question for you. Can you build a quine? in HTML. Let's have a look. 
There's a guy called Leon Bambrick. He's the secret geek on Twitter. And he created a brutalist HTML quine. I've adapted some of his ideas for this part of the talk. So we're going to start. This web page prints its own source code. And then we're going to have a look and right-click view source. And we get this. HTML head, title, head body. Yeah, OK, fine. No problem so far. Now we're going to start breaking some rules. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to put a CSS rule in there that says display everything as a block in a monospaced mono font. And we switch back to it, and now suddenly we can see things that normally human beings aren't supposed to see. Normally this is for the computer to figure out. We're going to switch back to our code, and we're going to use some CSS pseudo selectors before and after to add HTML and slash HTML. Now, you see we've got HTML at the top. The slash HTML is here, but it's rendered off the bottom of the viewport. We'll bring that back in a second. We're going to now add a rule that says print style. Now, slash style, we need to escape with a backslash. Otherwise, the HTML parser will see slash style and think that's the end of the style sheet, and that is not what we want to happen here. We're going to put a pre-wrap white space style on that, and now we can see style slash style. We're going to jump back into our code. Now, we just need to paste in a whole bunch of these before and after things to enclose all our HTML tags. But here we go. We now have all our tags opened and closed. What's missing is the href on that anchor tag. A href equals there's no href here. Well, we can do that with CSS as well. We can say a href before content, pull out the attribute value, drop that into the content here, and there we go. I'm going to add one more rule to this. I'm just going to give it a margin, and I'm going to hack the height so we can see slash HTML, and there we go. We have a web page here that prints its own source code. This is completely useless. Nobody would ever do this for any good reason other than to push the boundaries of HTML and CSS, to learn more than they knew before about the parsers and the escape syntax and what's possible using the constraints of those languages. Let's have a look at this chunk of code. Now, uh, when I do this talk in person, what I normally do is I say to people, hey, what language do you think this is written in? And a couple of people always go, uh, hash include, that's C. And a couple of other people look at it and they're like, no, def, print f, q, that's, that's, that's Ruby or something. Well, let's have a look. Let's apply some syntax highlighting. So this program in C, hash include standard.io.h main char star. Now, this is not very good C, but it is valid C code. But now I'm going to apply a Ruby syntax highlighter to the same source code, and I'm going to highlight the string literals. Now, that's not very good Ruby, but it is valid Ruby. So which is it? Is this a C program or a Ruby program? Well, I don't know, and there's only one way to find out when you have mysterious code you found on the internet that you don't understand, and that's to build it and run it. So I'm going to show you the contents of this program. There it is. And now I'm going to run that through GCC. And I'm going to see what it does. It says one warning generated, but <laughs> if you didn't want to see warnings, you've come to the wrong talk. It prints its own source code. Look at that. It's a valid C program that prints its own source. But now I'm going to run the same thing through the Ruby interpreter. And it's a Ruby program that prints its own source code. I'm going to run it through Python just to see what happens, because, hey, that's just the kind of developer that I am. And, ooh, there we go. It's a valid program in Python that prints its own source code. Let's run it through Perl just to see what happens. And there it is. It's also a valid program in Perl that prints its own source code. This will also print its own source in C++, if you can find a compiler that doesn't complain about main not having a return type. This is a polyquine. It is a program that prints its own source code in more than one language. Now, have a look at this chunk of code here and tell me what language do you think this is written in? Now, this could be system.console. That looks like kind of a .NET kind of a thing, right? And then we've got an XML namespace with an XSL transform on it. And we've got a for each and a console.log, which it kind of smells a little bit JavaScripty, right? Um, we've got an ADA text IO procedure, which uh, I'm not an ADA programmer, but they assure me that's what it looks like. We have begin in block capital letters, which means this is a very important business program like COBOL or Microsoft SQL or something. And we have act one, scene one, enter Ajax. Now that doesn't look like programming at all. This is a snippet from Yosuke Endo's 
Ouroboros Quine. The Ouroboros Quine is a program written in Ruby, and when you run it, it generates a program written in Rust. And when you run the Rust program, it generates a program in Scala that produces a scheme program, that produces a said program that goes all the way around the circle of 128 programming languages. And eventually you end up with a Python program that produces an R program, that produces a Rex program, that produces the original Ruby program back out the other end of the chain. That's not the cool part. The cool part is the source code to the Ouroboros Quine looks like this. Did I say that was the cool part? That's not the cool part. Um, the cool part is this part here. If you zoom in on the end of the Ouroboros Quine, this has a maintenance plan. This has been engineered with a buffer in it for future bug fixes. That's not even the cool part. The really cool part is that all 128 of those languages, from the mainstream ones like C and Ruby to the really weird esoteric ones, all of those languages are available on Ubuntu Linux via Aptitude. You can apt-get install all of them, which means there is a GitHub Actions continuous integration pipeline for the Ouroboros Quine. It uses a Docker container, and it compiles all 128 languages and makes sure you get the original build out the other end. That's cool. Now, what was going on there with Act 1, Scene 1, Enter Ajax? Well, it turns out there is a programming language called Shakespeare. And Shakespeare is designed to let you write computer programs which look like the plays of William Shakespeare. Here is Hello World in Shakespeare. The infamous Hello World program. Now the variables are declared by introducing the cast, Romeo and Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 1. This is how scoping and namespacing works. Enter Hamlet and Romeo brings those variables into scope. And then Hamlet talks to Romeo and says, you lying, stupid, fatherless, big, smelly, half-witted coward. You are as stupid as the difference between a handsome, rich, brave hero and thyself. Speak your mind. This causes Romeo to print the letter H. What is happening there? Every time Hamlet insults Romeo, lying, stupid, fatherless, big smelly, it decrements the value of Romeo. Every time Hamlet compliments Romeo, says something nice, that will increment the value. The difference between is arithmetic and speak your mind is standard out. H. The next section, you are as brave as the sum, da 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 da, that will print E. We turn to page two, L, L, O space. Eventually, we get, after three or four pages, we get Hello World. But hey, you know, Shakespeare didn't write short plays, so Shakespeare programs should not be short programs. Let's have a look at another programming language. Now, again, this is not a problem with the stream. This is Hello World in the programming language called Whitespace. I'm going to apply some, some syntax highlighting here. The instruction set of Whitespace is combinations of spaces and tabs, and that's all it cares about. It ignores everything else. Everything in Whitespace is a comment except the Whitespace. So you can hide Whitespace programs inside other programs, which I think is kind of cool. Now. There is another programming language, which is called Chef. And Chef is designed for writing programs that are also recipes. Now, the, the canonical Hello World that you get in Chef is this, the Hello World Souffle. This recipe prints Hello World. It also makes a lot of food. And then you look at the, the ingredients here, and you're like, 72 grams of, of haricot beans and 101 eggs, lard, oil, 32 zucchinis. You know, this does not look terribly appetizing. <laughs> And that's where a guy called Mike Worth comes into the picture, because Mike Worth created the Hello World chocolate cake. This is a recipe that if you implement it on your kitchen, you get a chocolate cake with a chocolate sauce. And if you implement it and run it on the chef interpreter, it says, Hello World. Now, the beautiful thing, the thing I love about this is that if you give someone this cake, they will have no idea they are eating a computer program. They'll just think it's a cake. Apparently, it's a little bit dry, but it is still something which is completely valid in two non-intersecting domains. It's a recipe for an actual cake, and it's a computer program that prints Hello World. Let's look at how to square a number in the programming language called Pete. That's the source code. Pete is a graphical programming language. It starts with this instruction set. This is the color palette that it works with. The way that that program works, the instruction pointer starts in the top left corner, traveling east. When it crosses from blue into green, that 
boundary is the input instruction. Read a number from standard input. When it hits black, it changes direction. Green into red, duplicate the value on the top of the stack. Red into yellow, multiply the top two values on the stack and put the result back on the stack. Yellow into red, output. Output the number. Crossing the white is a no operation. We get into the blue region. We hit the edge of the grid. We follow that all the way around until there's black on all sides. End of program. Halt. That is Pete, the graphical programming language, named for Pete Mondrian. And Hello World in Pete looks like this. Now, you could print this out and frame this and put this up on the wall in your house. And people who looked at it, they might say you had questionable taste in art, but they would probably have no idea that they were looking at a computer program that prints Hello World. Now, we've talked in this about the idea of, you know, using software to uh, create art. And we talked about the idea of software being an art form in its own right. You write some source code, which is also a, a work of art. And quite often, when you go to conferences like uh, JPoint and, you know, other events, you'll see people doing live coding demos, which is almost programming as performance art, right? And there's always an element of risk in a live demo because you're like, well, something might not work. Something might go wrong. Maybe the code will fail to compile. And that kind of makes it exciting. Now, in software, we don't like things that might go wrong. We try and automate everything. We want stuff to be predictable and we want it to be repeatable. And we have unit tests and integration tests and automation tests and continuous delivery pipelines. And we lock down the variables and we script our environments. And things that don't play by the rules we have a word for them. We call them snowflakes. Oh, that's the snowflake server. Don't touch it. Don't install Windows Update on it, or we can't run the payroll system. It's fragile. It's one of a kind. It's unique, and we don't know how it works. But if you go out in a snowstorm, and you pick a snowflake out of the air, and you just watch it and let it melt on your hand, you've just been part of a unique experience that nobody else in history is ever going to share. Every snowflake is different, and you are the only one who ever saw that. Because performance has this idea of being part of something unique, something that will never be repeated. And that brings us on to the idea of software development as a unique performance art form. This is the Royal Albert Hall here in London. This is the London Philharmonic Orchestra and sat up on the right hand side of your screen underneath the big screen there, that is a guy called Sam Aaron and Sam created a programming language called Sonic Pi. And Sonic Pi is a live coding music synthesizer. It is a programming language that creates music. Now, I'm gonna do a very quick live demo for you now. Basically, you open up Sonic Pi and the fundamental command of Sonic Pi is play. Play A3, that is gonna play a musical note. Then we are gonna say play C4. Now, Sonic Pi does everything in parallel unless you tell it not to. Imagine if JavaScript ran all your statements simultaneously unless you put delays and sleeps in there. We put sleeps in, we get this. Now, where it gets really interesting is that Sonic Pi has loops and conditionals. So we can put in this. Now, that's not terribly exciting, right? Like, it's, it's, a, it's a, a rhythm, but it's a fairly slow rhythm. So let's spice things up a bit. We're going to crank up the tempo here a little bit. There we go. We're running at 244 beats per minute now. And we're going to change that synthesizer noise to something called text source. And now we're going to get something that sounds... Yeah? musically a little more interesting, but now we're gonna to get to the really cool part because Sonic Pi has a feature called Live Loops, which allow you to modify your program while it is running without dropping a beat. No stopping, no restarting. It just patches the code live on the fly as it is processing. So I'm gonna turn that into a live loop and I'm gonna run it. And then over the top of that, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna put in another live loop that is synced to the main one. And this is gonna play some drum sounds for us. It's gonna play a closed symbol and then it's gonna play an open symbol. And I can drop that in on top of my program and that will start playing some percussion over the top of it. And I'm gonna copy and paste this drum loop that I pulled out earlier. I'm gonna drop that in alongside my program. I'm gonna run the whole thing and it's gonna bring in a drum track alongside that without having to stop or restart the program at any point. And now I'm gonna do some arithmetic. I'm gonna introduce a counter variable here. And for every note, I'm gonna say, if the number of this note divides by three, 
play this note instead. If the number of this note is divisible by five, I want you to play this note instead. Now, some of you might see what algorithm is being implemented here. Algorithm, beloved of technical interviews and recruiters everywhere, the FizzBuzz algorithm. And if it divides by 15, play this note. And so what we've done there is we've got the FizzBuzz riff. We've created a melody by doing audio programming in real time to take the FizzBuzz algorithm and turn it into something musical. Now, Sonic Pi is fantastic. A lot of the things I've shown you today so far, they're amazing, wonderful, inspiring, beautiful things that were created by other people. I want to wrap up the talk today by telling you about something that I did. Now, you have probably seen the trope come across in you know LinkedIn and recruitment and everything of the rock star developer. This whole idea, we are seeking a, a rock star junior web developer. We're seeking a rock star front end, rock star JavaScript, rock star this, rock star everybody. And a couple of years ago, Paul Stavell on Octopus Deploy popped up on Twitter and he said, hey, to confuse recruiters, somebody should make a programming language called Rockstar. And I saw this tweet and I had this experience. I had a moment of blinding divine revelation because I thought this is what I need to do. This is why I was put here. What the world needs is a programming language based on heavy metal and rock bands from the 1980s. Now, the Rockstar programming language was invented in a bar. I'll tell you in a minute why this is important. Rockstar is a dynamically typed Turing complete programming language designed for creating computer programs that are also song lyrics. Rockstar programs are songs, you can sing them. And it is heavily influenced by the lyrical conventions of 1980s hard rock and power ballads. How do you write hello world in Rockstar? Say hello world. But maybe you don't wanna say it. Maybe you want to scream it. Maybe you want to whisper it. Maybe you want to shout it. Rockstar is about expressing yourself. Variables and assignment. Now in the conventional computer programming, int space x space equals space five semicolon. Var my underscore string equals hello world, the message equals coding rocks. And there's a lot of unnecessary noise going on here. Now, first of all, if it's dynamically typed, we can get rid of the types. And if we're using some kind of parser based on new lines, we can get rid of the semicolons. All right, that's easy. Now, equals is not terribly rock and roll. We just say is. X is five. My string is hello world. Now, I saw Douglas Crockford, the guy who created JSON, give a talk a few years ago where he was talking about the, the ideas in programming that are so controversial, we don't even talk about them. And one of the things he said is we have all these arguments, you know, Pascal case, camel case, chainsaw case, kebab case, snake case. He said, what we really want is variable names with spaces in them. Now, when you invent a programming language in a bar for a joke, you can do anything you like. So, hey, we have variable names with spaces in them. It's not quite that wide open. I did give some consideration to how this might work by having prefixes. So simple variables, foobar baz, just like in Ruby, Python, VB script, Perl. Common variables have to start with one of these keywords. My heart, an ocean, your dream. And proper variables need capital letters. Dr. Feelgood, Black Betty, Billie Jean. I wanted a way of introducing numbers without having to type digits because digits are not terribly rock and roll. So I came up with an idea called a poetic literal. Now, in normal programming, fizz equals three, fizz is three, buzz is five. I thought, what if we take the is operator and we count the number of letters in the words on the end of those lines and treat them as digits in a decimal number. Fizz is ice, one, two, three. Buzz is dying, five. The limit is A1. Lovestruck is 10, is zero, modulus 10. Lovestruck lady killer, one, zero, zero, 100. Now I have a way of initializing variables without using numeric literals. In C sharp, decimal pi is 3.141. In JavaScript, pi equals 3.14. In Rockstar, my heart was ice, a life unfulfilled, waking everybody up, taking booze and pills. Ice, one, two, three, dot, one, four, one, five, nine, three, six, five. We can do floating point numbers as well. Arithmetic. Now, <clears throat> in English, 
you listen to people talking about maths and they're like, oh, how much is it? Oh, the bill is the price with the tax. It's the total without the tax. It's the, the quantity of the product. It's the distance over the time is velocity. So we can use these keywords to avoid arithmetic operators, but also a girl with a dream, a man without a face, the wings of the night, a whisper over the water. Comparison operators, so we can do loops and flow control. Your love is a lie, true or false. The whiskey ain't the answer, not equal to. My heart is stronger than steel. My soul is weaker than water. My will is as strong as a lion. Your lies are as low as a snake. Now, this is kind of getting close to something that I think might maybe be implementable, maybe. Needs function syntax. Now, functions are difficult because most languages we use brackets and braces and block syntax and indentation, all these kind of things. But then you think, listen to people talking about functions. You know, two developers on your team. One of them's, oh yeah, so that's the modulus function. It takes a number and a divisor, um, and then while the number's as high as the divisor, you assign, you put the number without the divisor into the number. Now, in Rockstar, a blank line is a block terminator, so we don't have to close braces and things. Give back a number. Or Midnight takes your heart and your soul. And while your heart is as high as your soul, put your heart without your soul into your heart and give back your heart. Now, round right about this point, I'm thinking this is pretty good. I write up a parody language specification. I stick it on GitHub. I put it on Twitter and I get a bed. And I think maybe this will be funny for a day or two. Um, and the internet finds it and the internet likes it. And the internet gets a little bit excited about it. It makes the front page of Hacker News. It makes Boing Boing Magazine, uh, Cory Doctorow. It makes uh, Reddit. It makes the front page there. People are saying nice things about it. There's all these fantastic comments coming out of it. Then something happens that I really did not expect. A couple of days later, I get an email from Classic Rock Magazine, which is a real rock and roll magazine here in the UK that interviews you know, people like Metallica and Scorpions. And I get this email there. I'm saying, hey, what's this rock star thing we're hearing about? And they do a feature on it. And I get in Classic Rock Magazine for inventing a stupid programming language in a bar, uh, which I still think is either very cool or very nerdy. I'm not until maybe they're the same thing. Who knows? But that wasn't even the weird part. A couple of days later, people started filing issues against the GitHub repository for Rockstar. And I was like, why are you filing issues against my parody joke specification? And they said, because there's undefined behavior in the spec. And I said, so? And I said, because I'm implementing a Rockstar compiler, and my compiler has undefined behavior. And at this point, it just kind of blew my mind. I was like, really? People are implementing this? And there were about six implementations. There was a, a Rockstar to Python transpiler. Somebody built a Rockstar interpreter in Rust. And this thing didn't go away. You know, I thought this was just going to be poof and uh, kind of fun for a couple of days and then everyone gets bored. But like six months later, it was still popping up and making the front page of Reddit every couple of months and stuff. And people started saying that, you know, I was the creator of the Rockstar programming language. And I was like, well, I kind of like that. I like the way it sounds, but I don't really think I earned the right. I think writing a joke spec in a bar is not really enough work to justify that. I also had this idea. I wanted everybody in the world to be able to be a rock star developer without installing anything, without downloading anything. And I figured that the way to solve these two problems was I had to build my own rock star interpreter in JavaScript so I could run it in a web browser. Um, if any of you ever built a uh, language interpreter and parser in JavaScript, it's difficult. It's also a lot of fun. That's what I did at the beginning of last year. That is live today on codewithrockstar.com. Now, you can go here, you can write your program in that box, you can click rock, and if it runs, congratulations, you are a rock star developer, all of you. Now, if this was a physical conference, we would hang out later and I have little rock star stickers I give to people. Instead of that, join us in the discussion zone later and I'll give you some special rock star certification animated GIFs that you can use instead until we can get together again. I can give you all some real stickers. Now, I just want to say thank you to somebody because you see the branding on this website here has this, this kind of crazy 1980s rock star logo on it. Um, and I wanted to something, some inspiration for this logo. And I looked around at all these different rock bands and metal bands. I didn't come up with anything really that I, I liked very much until I found this, the Microsoft Consumer Products logo, 1980 to 1982. 
I love this. I thought I'm going to use that. Microsoft weren't using it anymore, so I recycled that. So check it out, codewithrockstar.com. Thank you, Microsoft, for the logo. You can become part of the world's most prestigious developer program. And finally today, now I'm going to hand over to my pre-recorded counterpart for the last part of this performance because there's still some constraints on what is possible with live stream technology. But you remember the chocolate cake that was also Hello World, and you remember the Hello World in Pete that was also a painting? I want to perform Fizz Buzz in Rockstar for you now, and you can be the judge. Do you think that this is a valid song as well as being a valid computer program or not? Thank you, Jay Point. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jay Point. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. 
<laughs> hey, Oleg, how you doing? Uh, uh, I don't know what to say. That was really beautiful. <laughs> okay. Spasiba, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So we have so questions I see, in our chat. Yeah, well, I, I can see a couple of questions in Telegram. So, hey, Evgeny, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Um, so, so Evgeny's question, have you tried this Rockstar program song on people who had no idea it's a program? Um, I haven't. And uh, the reason for that, one kind of programmers are my audience. Like if I just go, I'm going to do a show, uh, probably nobody would come because, you know, you, you are my people out there. Um, but also there's one detail about this that I, I, I still am not quite happy with which is the bit in the song where it goes shout fizz and it's got fizz and buzz and fizz buzz and those kind of don't fit they're part of the joke but if it was a real song uh you'd want to build that up differently and so i have a, an idea i'm playing around with with array syntax where instead of having string literals you kind of build it up by almost like shakespeare works you increment values to get ascii code and then you turn that into a word so you can build up fizz and buzz but you never have to use those strings anywhere in your program uh, when i get to that point at that point, I can play it at people and go, hey, look, I wrote this song. What do you think? And they'll be like, yeah, it's all right. And I'll be like, ha, but it's a computer program. And they'll be like, yeah, still all right. And I'll be like, all right, I need to write better songs. Uh, but hey, I've been trying to write better songs since I was nine years old. So nothing will be new there. Um, so yeah, but no, to date, I have not tried out FizzBuzz or, or any other rock star song programs on anybody else um, without telling them that it's a computer program first. But I like that. It's an interesting idea. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so we did a, Vasily had a question in, in Telegram about, um, quantum computers, uh, and the art of code. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, one of the, the amazing things, uh, that, uh, uh, Sophia, there is not a recording of the song yet, but after this, so J point today, this is like the last conference I had in my calendar so far for the whole, like, you know, the pandemic lockdown, I've been so busy, like setting up and doing virtual talks after today, I get a couple of weeks to sit at home and record music and put things on YouTube. And the fizz buzz song is going to be one of the ones that goes up there. So it'll, it'll be up there in a couple of weeks. So, uh, youtube.com slash Dylan BT is where I, I put all my music and code stuff. Um, so yeah, Vasily had a question about quantum computing. Um, I have no idea. I mean, one of the really interesting things in putting together the, the Art of Code talk was, uh, you know, things like like Sonic Pi and Pete and also, uh, you know, the, the Mandelbrot set Zooms and the obfuscated code and deep dreaming, all these things, you know, it's not like anybody went, ooh, if we had convolutional neural networks, then we would be able to do deep dreaming. You know, we created them for a different purpose, but throughout human history, you know, we create technology through engineering and then artists go, hey, I got a cool idea that I can, I can use that. I can do something with that. Um, and, you know, we have artists who they work in, in paint and artists who work in sculpture and steel and welding and ice and all kinds of different media and technologies. Um, I have no idea what quantum computing art is going to look like, but I'm sure when quantum computers become widely available, somebody is going to come up with something that we could never do before. Uh, one of the things I'm really interested in, actually, is, is not quantum, but it's augmented reality. And it's the idea of creating artwork that has to be immersive. Like, unless you're wearing a headset, you can't really do it. Uh, because I showed you there that the Mandelbrot certain things. There's some stuff online you can see where... People have taken four-dimensional fractals. So as well as, as real numbers, one, two, three, and the imaginary number i, there's also j and k, which are, they just went, well, what if, what if i squared is minus one and j squared is minus k and k squared is minus j, and then we can do four-dimensional complex arithmetic. Um, and they've created four-dimensional fractals, which are things called quaternions. Um, now, the problem with the four-dimensional shape is we can't see it. And really what we can do is we can take four dimensions and we can render it into three dimensions and then render three dimensions in two dimensions and put that on a flat computer screen. But I want to put on a, a VR, like an, an augmented reality, a HoloLens headset or an Oculus Rift or something. And I want to play with four dimensional fractals in three dimensional space, the way that we play with three dimensional fractals in two dimensional space and see what happens. So that's another project that's somewhere out there on my bucket list. But you know, virtual reality headsets, I, I kind of, I'm really interested in what's going on with them. But I think if anybody here is old enough to remember what MP3 players were like before the first iPod, so there was a thing called the Creative Nomad, and there was the Diamond Rio, and there's all these other, you know, solid state music players. And I think virtual reality is at that stage right now. 
like they've solved some of the problems and enthusiasts have them and they're cool and they're interesting but i think we are within maybe a year something is going to happen which will be like the ipod of vr headsets and, and ai headsets and at that point everyone's going to have one and at that point suddenly we're going to see people starting to use them for different kinds of art and creativity and programming and all kinds of things we can't even imagine um and you know those aren't going to happen until the technology is cheap enough that people go yeah i'm going to play with that um you know there was a time when computing power was too expensive to use for fun uh, and then people started doing the first computer games and the first fractal geometry. And, and I'll know this is serious research, but actually they're, they're just kind of goofing around with it. And now, of course, we've got so much computing power, we can do anything we want and not really worry about who's paying the bill. Uh, so, yeah, I have no idea what quantum computing art is going to look like, but I think we're going to get augmented reality art first. Um, and that I'm interested to see what we can do with rendering four-dimensional art in three-dimensional space. Uh, another question from uh, Evgeny. While making Rockstar, did you have the idea of compiling lyrics. Um, so the closest yet, uh, the song Rock You Like a Hurricane by Scorpions, about 80% of that is syntactically valid in Rockstar. It doesn't do anything, but it's you look at the, the syntax of that song, it's early morning, I have to go. Most of those lyrics actually uh, validate the syntax. Um, and I have thought about extending the grammar of the language so that certain songs actually become valid programs. I just have, have no idea what they would what they would do or how they would behave. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dimitri's got another safe point for a call. So if you look on my YouTube channel, that's where I put all the songs where I've changed the lyrics to be about computer programming, because that's what I do. <laughs> Mikhail says, don't try this, it might build Skynet. Well, you know, Skynet's got to come from somewhere, but hey, maybe Skynet will, will make art. Um, so we got, I, I think, about seven minutes oh, yeah, we got left on the broadcast. Um, uh, yeah, seven minutes. <laughs> Uh, by the way, uh, is there any other interesting esoteric languages that are not made in, the, in this talk? Actually, there's quite a few. Um, there's a lot of esoteric languages out there. Uh, there's one, the earliest one I ever saw was way back in the late 1990s, and it was, uh, it's called Perligata. And it's a guy called Damien Conway who created a way of using Latin to write Perl programs. So I don't know if any of you ever worked in Perl. Um, Perl is a, a kind of slightly weird language in its syntax because you can have a variable called foo, and then like at foo means foo is an array, and a dollar foo means foo is an array, and at foo means foo is a hash, and something else foo means foo is a scalar. And so there's all these different ways foo is an argument, foo is a function reference. Um, and what Damien Conway did is he took the rules of Latin grammar, a mo, a mass, a mat, the different uh, declension forms of different words, and he said, well, let's use those instead of dollar, hash, pound sign um, to make Perl into Latin. And he came up with a, a formal grammar for writing Perl programs using Latin grammar to control variable access and stuff. Um, and so that one, I, I remember looking at that years ago and just thinking, this is really cool. Um, and then there's a whole family of languages uh, that they're called the Turing Tarpits. Because basically, uh, if any of you have, have played with the, the idea of the universal Turing machine, um, you can create a Turing complete computer using an infinite tape and about three or four uh, different instructions. And it turns out, I think you need eight. I think to, to build any a, a Turing complete computer, you need like uh, increment, decrement, um, address pointer, bitwise arithmetic, input and output. And that gives you eight instructions and you can use those to build any program. So there's all these different programs which have just got eight inputs. Um, and there's one called Ook, which is named after like the Discworld novels by Terry Pratchett. They have the librarian who's an orangutan and all he ever says is Ook. And so it's like Ook with a question mark is read standard input and Ook with an exclamation point is write to standard output and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so Ook is another, and there's a whole bunch of, you know, family of those. Uh, there's Emoji Code, which is the programming language where all the instructions are emoji, which uh, looks like that, that could be it's quite good fun. Um, and, you know, there's lots of these. There's a website called Rosetta Code where you find problems being translated into different languages. And then there's the really evil ones, which are languages like Intercal and Malbolge, which are designed to be impossible to program in. So if anyone wants to have some fun, uh, go away after this talk and look up or, or drop in on the discussion zone um, and look up Intercal and Malbolge and find out just how evil programming language design can be. Um, so uh, Evgeny again saying, with a things that you'd like to implement in Rockstar but found no way to do. Um, 
no, I I have ideas about all of it. It's just finding the time and the language syntax. Because, uh, you know, one, you've got to have a bit of time. And also, uh, I know it's a joke project, but I kind of care about reverse compatibility. I don't want to upset all the Generation 1 Rockstar programmers by saying, hey, you're not a Rockstar programmer anymore because your program doesn't compile. Um, and there's a surprising amount of, you know, complexity and consideration in making even trivial changes to a language syntax. Um, <laughs> but no, so far, everything that I wanted to do, I found a couple of different ways of doing it. I just haven't necessarily had the time to put it in, in production yet. Um, Mm. Dimitri, what's the technology stack for the compiler and interpreter? So uh, the one that is on codewithrockstar.com, it's open source. If you go on, on GitHub, I'll stick a, a link in the, the Telegram chat. Um, I'm not actually at my desk right now. I'm standing back so I can, I can talk to you on the good camera. Um, but it's using a thing called PEG.js. It's a parsing expression grammar to tokenize Rockstar input into a JSON document, which is the abstract syntax tree for the language. And then it runs the syntax tree through a metacircular evaluator, which is basically a big JavaScript loop that uh, does um, continuation parsing, captures environment variables in enclosures and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's all open source. It's all, I think, MIT licensed. So you can go and, and poke around on those projects, run it for yourself and see how it works. Uh, it's actually a lot of fun. And one of the things that I, I hope to get some time to do this year is to port it from, I have a, a prototype in .NET as well, and I'm also looking at building a version in TypeScript because one of the problems with using JSON for a syntax tree is that the nodes for the different expression types, you have to use strings to uh, discriminate between them, whereas TypeScript, I could actually use some types in there, and that would give me a, a more flexible model for it. Um, but the, the heavy lifting by the parser is done by PEG.js, which is a formal uh, framework for doing parsing expression grammar that output JavaScript uh, expressions. So, uh, and that it runs in Node.js, it runs, there's a test suite for it in Mocha, um, and it also, it's uh, browserified, so it runs in the browser on codewithrockstar.com. So that's one code base for the test suite, server side and, and client side. Um, and we have, I think we, we have two minutes and 30 seconds left. So, <laughs> so we'll have plenty of time to chat over in the discussion zone. Um, but is there, is there one final question before we drop the live broadcast? Oh, let's wait for five seconds. Oh, yeah, we have a question. Yeah. Have you, <laughs> have you thought about, about using music notes? Yeah. yeah. Um, not yet. Uh, I quite like the idea of uh, writing a rock star program that outputs data, like maybe MIDI data, or maybe just some note data that you then feed into something else that generates the music that accompanies the lyrics. So you have a program that the lyrics to the program, or the, the, the text of the program is the lyrics to the song, and the output of the program is the music to the song. Um, but at that point, it's like lyrics and music and programming all combine the same way. Uh, so... I don't know, maybe. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people have said, could we have a, a Rockstar compiler that we give it a Rockstar program and it generates the music for the song? And I'm like, well, there's people working on that. Like someone's trained a neural network to write ACDC songs. Uh, if you go and look that up, that's on YouTube at the moment. So there's certainly a lot of interesting stuff. But you know, mainly for me, um, writing music is one of the things I like to do by hand. It's not something I want to write a computer program to do for me because I enjoy songwriting. Um, and so I'm not hugely excited about the idea of a program that makes melodies because that's my thing. You know, I like that. I, I do that thing for fun. Uh, so, all right. Looks like we're, we're, we're rolling down. We have one minute. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in um, and, and watching and sticking with us all through the whole virtual conferences. It's been weird for the speakers. It's been weird for the attendees. Um, it's been, I know it's weird for the organizers and everything, uh, but the, the platform that Juggera are using for all this, I've been really, really impressed with it. Um, yeah, but you, so you should really show the power of uh, live streaming because <laughs> that's, uh, that really works very well. And the so, talk is absolutely mind-blowing. <laughs> thank, thank you very you. much. Dylan, uh, I, I hope <laughs> there are some more questions. Uh, for discussion zone i will be in the discussion zone yes yes right. the link is already uh in telegram so i will will switch uh you you will switch to zoom and thanks okay, again everybody. i'll see you in the discussion zone